Okay, well, good evening, everyone, or good morning, if you're watching from the other side of the world, um, and welcome to the 2022 Drake Awards. Uh, my name is Simon Steele. I'm the Deputy Director of the Carl Sagan Center at the SETI Institute. And um, this first part of the evening's programming is, is a virtual one for some special guests who aren't able to be present at the actual award ceremonies here in Menlo Park in, in Silicon Valley. So I'm going to introduce um, our special guests in a few moments. Just a little bit of background. I'm sure many of you, if you've tuned in, unless you've tuned into the wrong Zoom uh, uh, meeting, know what the SETI Institute is. We're a, a nonprofit research organization based in Silicon Valley with uh, the goal of searching uh, for life in the universe in whatever form. Uh, it was founded back in 1984 as a SETI research uh, science center. Um, hence the name, uh, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. But since that time, uh, we have taken on many, many astrobiology researchers and uh, researchers who look for exoplanets, planets around other stars. And so we now have a very, very broad research base with the, the singular goal of finding life beyond Earth. Now, the Drake Awards is an annual award named after Frank Drake, one of the founders of the Institute. Um, and it is awarded to researchers who have contributed um, in exemplary ways to the field of searching for life beyond Earth. We have uh, three of the previous winners here, um, Bill Brookey, Vicky Meadows, and Paul Horowitz. And uh, you'll be hearing a little bit more about them in a few minutes um, when my colleague, uh, Franck Machis, will, will have a conversation uh, about their work and the award. There are two other awards uh, being offered this evening. Uh, once uh, this, this original virtual session will end, we will go for all of you virtually into the auditorium. Um, there will be uh, an award for um, the Carl Sagan Center, that is to a SETI Institute researcher. Uh, and this year's winner is Doug Caldwell, who has done uh, a lot of work on exoplanet um, uh, discoveries, and uh, you'll hear more about his work in the actual award itself. There's another award as well called the SETI Forward Award, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a second. But if you do have any questions during the session, please do put those questions into uh, the Q&A, and I will monitor and, and pass those questions on to everybody. Um, and also let us know where you're, you're uh, uh, tuning in from. Um, the nice thing about Zoom and this as a virtual event means that you can tune in anywhere uh, in the world. So please do let us know where you're, where you're tuning in from. So a little bit more about the, the, uh, uh, the SETI Forward Award. This is given to um, students who are making the transition between internships and, and uh, research in their early careers. It's a stipend um, designed to help them attend uh, professional conferences to present their work. It's originally um, uh, developed by two um, of uh, uh, the SETI Institute supporters, Dane Glasgow and Lou Levy, who uh, put together this idea of uh, making an award to make or to try and hold um, young researchers into the SETI field. Uh, uh, there are many students who, who go through uh, studying SETI and think that's a really amazing thing, but I'm going to go off and study galaxies or I'm going to go off and study some other area of, of astrophysics and physics. But uh, hopefully the, the SETI Forward Award will keep people um, in the SETI field and, and that is the purpose of the award. There are four recipients tonight um, and I'm going to have to read out the names from the sheet. Uh, Rafi Truss, um, who is an undergraduate at University of Wisconsin. Uh, Zoe Weiss is a junior at Harvard University, concentrating in chemical and physical biology. And Mary Claire Greenlease, who is a senior at Barnard College. And they are all have all managed to make it to the, the meeting tonight. But our special guest in this session is Iwei Chai. And um, I would like to welcome you to uh, this, this Zoom call, Iwei. Um, you can't make this for a particular reason. You can't come here tonight. And what is yes. that reason? Um, it is because I'm graduating this week. So 
tied up with graduation things. Tied up with graduation. Congratulations <laughs> on, on that, that ceremony. Um, uh, say a little bit about uh, where you're graduating from and, um, you know, what I suppose um, have, has kept you so far in studying um, astrophysics and specifically SETI. What, what's yeah, what drawn sure. you to this? So I, I guess I'm a graduating senior at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and I am majoring in, in physics with a concentration in astro. Um, and I think that, you know, I have a very typical story. I'll, as a kid, I was really fascinated by space. Um, but as I got a little older, I think I was not as good at STEM subjects and I sort of diverted into the humanities. And then when I came to college, because, you know, you have to undertake a broad interdisciplinary set of courses your first couple of years, I ended up taking this um, seminar on exoplanets in the solar system that was not for STEM majors. And I sort of fell back in love with space um, and eventually decided to major in it. So, yeah. So what, what aspects, um, you say that was um, uh, sort of exoplanets, what, what sort of, what is, what is, what part of, of searching for life in the universe excites you? I mean, what, what would you like to, to do uh, ultimately? I think that SETI is so exciting to me because it really is this combination of the astrophysical sciences and also thinking about ourselves as human beings and our civilization and wondering, you know, what kind of questions can we ask about the potential other civilizations that might exist and how does that reflect on how we think of ourselves as humans or as a civilization? So I like that there's a bit of an interdisciplinary flavor to it. Yeah, yeah. It's certainly, you know, of, of, all, of all, I mean, a lot of sciences and a lot of subjects ha have a global effect. Yeah. Um, but uh, this one may well have a, you know, that really could be a profound uh, effect on, on us as a, as, a, as a species, as a society. That's, that's cool. Now you, uh, part of your work uh, took you up to the Hat Creek Radio Observatory. Indeed. Um, say a little bit about Hat Creek. It was really wonderful. Um, I think that maybe a lot of people my age don't really get the opportunity to be device free um, for in an extended period of time. And I found it very refreshing to go up to the site um, no mobile devices, and just be in a rather isolated observatory, immersed in the daily life of the scientists working there um, for a week or so. So it was a very fascinating experience for me. Yeah. And you worked um, with um, Dr. Wael Thara yeah. um, at, at the observatory. How was, how was that, was that your first trip to a, a radio telescope? Was that your first yes, sort of experience? It was, it was my first experience going to an observatory, actually. So, to an, an observatory yeah. period. Wow. Okay. Okay. And what, um, go through the steps. Of, I mean, uh, radio, uh, op, uh, most people have a, a good understanding of optical um, mm -hmm. uh, astronomy. Um, I, I'm an optical <laughs> astronomer, so, so I do like, like visible photons. But um, mm -hmm. ra radio astronomy is, 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 is quite different isn't it, it um, yeah. although you're still collecting light it just happens to be along the wavelength but but the the the, the process is, is is very very different isn't it yeah um something that really boggled me when I first started I guess the internship last summer was that for radio astronomy you can observe during the daytime um and that was something that I just hadn't really thought about before mm -hmm. the other thing that I find really cool about radio astronomy is that you can use essentially you can set up radio interferometers. And so um, the observatory up at Hat Creek is this collection of about, I think 42 six meter dishes. Um, and you can sort of use them all pointing in different directions or in the same direction to observe things. Um, and I think that that's, that's very cool instead of having the one typical optical telescope. Right, I'm gonna share a, a, my screen here and I think, um... Uh, if that's coming through clear, I, hopefully it is. Um, yeah. This is uh, um, Hat Creek Observatory. Uh, it's a, in, in uh, Lassen National Park in Northern California. And uh, these are three of the um, 42, um, I think that's coincidence, uh, antennae 
of which now um, I believe 24, uh, assumed to be 30 of the antennae are actually going to be working. Um, the, these look as though they're pointing to the ground. Are they sort of, you know, sort of tracking gophers? Is that, uh, that's, that's an interesting thing about the geometry of these, these uh, antennae, isn't it? Yeah, um, I think it's pretty cool that they have the off-axis design. I don't totally recall why that was the case, um, but on one of the days, the head engineer at the site let us get up really close to the telescope and he opened the little hatch up. If you can see the silver thing kind of sticking out horizontally. Mm -hmm. um, so we got to see the inside and the feed um, and get really up close to the instrumentation. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. Um, just gonna uh, say we've got a, quite a few people um, joining us for, uh, from the island of Aruba, it was the first one, welcome. Um, Alaska, uh, New York, San Diego, Toronto, um, the Denver, Australia, the Philippines, um, Arizona, and congratulations uh, to you for, for the award. Um, uh, Puerto Rico, uh, Cheshire in the UK, uh, they've got a big radio telescope up there. Um, and uh, Las Vegas and Boston, uh, to say uh, just a few. So, so really uh, tuning in around the world. Um, I suppose another thing is, you know, you, you're starting it off on your career and, you know, mm -hmm. one day a future uh, Drake Award winner. Um, what would you, what advice would you give to, to other researchers, you know, other, or even going back to high school kids about getting into science and, and even getting into study science? You know, what are your, what were your motivations there and what motivation would you give uh, to others who are thinking, or oh, maybe I just want to go into sort of uh, venture capitalism and, you know, or, or so. Um, I would say, so my motivation for doing astronomy and for SETI is, I just think it's so fascinating. Um, and I think that, especially when you're entering college and when you have the opportunity to really pursue whatever academic interests you have, you should go for what you find interesting and what you find yourself asking questions about. Um, and I would really encourage people not to worry so much about whether or not they think they have the ability to be a maths person or a STEM person because I feel I thought that way in high school and since having gone through, I guess, a physics major for four years, I think that so long as the interest is there, you can always, you can always do it. Um, and I, I guess the other thing would be definitely go to your professor's office hours because it is super helpful. <laughs> right. Don't be intimidated by, by those yeah. professors. They are, <laughs> they love you showing up. Um, uh, at the door, and I'm sure everyone, oh, everyone else on the call can attest to that. Um, wonderful. Um, so, uh, what next for you? Um, you're going to get this this um, this award. It's a it's a fifteen hundred dollar award. Uh, mm -hmm. have, have you thought? Um, uh, is there anything coming up that that you think this will be useful to you uh, directly? Yeah. Um, so I will. I'm later to present a poster at the Absicon, um, which I think is later this week. Mm -hmm. So I think this is what is going to help with a lot of that, um, as well as just applying to present my work at future conferences. Okay. Where is Absicon? You're gonna, is this a, in person or is this a virtual meeting? So I'm attending virtually, but I think it's happening in Atlanta. Um, and I know that a lot of the friends that I made over the internship will also be presenting their work there. Okay, okay. Nice, thank you. Well, do, do any, um, any of the other um, guests on the call, uh, uh, Paul, Bill, uh, Vicky, any, any thoughts, any advice or any questions? Um, I would or... love any advice. <laughs> Vicky. Not, not immediately. I'll, I'll be going to Absicon too, um, but I, I will be in person. But uh, yeah, I mean, we're going to be trying to be doing a, a really big sort of virtual um, uh, program as well. So mm -hmm. I, hope, I hope you enjoy that. Yeah, um, I'm very excited for but, it. Yeah, and, and I have to say to Absicon too, we try and make sure that we talk across disciplines. And so I hope 
you, I, I guess my piece of advice for AppSycle would be, you know, just go to sessions that you even think you wouldn't be interested in because hopefully mm. everybody's going to be talking at a level where you can understand what's going on there. So, um, yeah, so that'll be, that'll be exciting. Yeah. Good. Excellent. Bill. Yes. Well, I certainly uh, second what Vicki had to say. You learn an awful lot by going to sessions that aren't your session uh, because all the science gets tied together in some sense especially when you're talking about trying to find, you know, exoplanets and what life might be like there and what is required to develop, evolve life. So all these different sessions can be uh, a real interest to you. I also like what you said, um, anyway, and that uh, if you're really interested in something, be persistent. It often takes a very long time and a lot of work to get to where you want to go, but it's worth the effort. So be persistent. Don't give up. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, it's a great talking to you, uh, Iwe. I'm sorry you can't be here, but um, hopefully we'll get a chance to see you at the, the SETI Institute, um, you know, at some time in, in the near future. Indeed. Thank you for having me virtually at this reception. Of course. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague, uh, Frank Machis, he's senior astronomer uh, at the SETI Institute. And um, while he does that, I am going out to, to the reception area, which I'm looking forward to. And um, uh, at 6.50, uh, we'll all go into the auditorium, either virtually or in person. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, wonderful speaking to you, Iwe. And I'm going to hand everything over to Thank Frank. you, Simon. Thanks a lot. Hello, everybody. Oh. Uh, Thank you again for being here. Um, so yeah, I just want to, before, before introducing you again, probably, I just want to mention that uh, the Drake Award is, um, is a Drake Award that we, we created at the SETI Institute to celebrate uh, amazing contribution in astrobiology, uh, in science, scientific research and space exploration. And this, was, this award was created in honor of um, Frank Drake, uh, was um, the director of the Carl Sagan Center and one of the founders of the SETI Institute, but also known for the Drake Equation. Okay. Um, so I have some uh, the three past um, honorary of the Drake Equation. Let me just introduce them. So we have uh, Bill Boroki. How are you, Bill? I'm doing just fine. I'm delighted to be here tonight. Thank I'm you. glad you're here virtually. Where are you calling us from? From the uh, sunniest uh, City in California, Sunnyvale. Oh, Sunnyvale, not far away from us. Okay. And uh, the second speaker is uh, Vicky Meadow. How are you, Vicky? I'm good. So Vicky, are you in Washington State right now? I, I am in Seattle in a very unsunny place. Um, yes, in fact, we, we call this season winter with flowers and uh, we are I'm gonna grab some food. very cold here, very cold. Not much above 50. Well, you should so. come here right now. Here it's like I know. It sounds lovely. Celsius and lovely, lovely spring we have. In. Uh, and the third speaker is uh, Paul Orovitz. Hi, Paul. How are you? Hi, just fine. And I'm dialing in here from People's Republic of Cambridge, Massachusetts. Cambridge, Massachusetts, on the other side of the country. Is that uh, it's late there? It's uh, coming something like a. Uh, yeah, and getting later. It's now 9.20. Okay, well, we're gonna try not to not to put you asleep right away. Okay, <laughs> I know it's uh, it's late. Um, so yeah, I wanted to talk to you about um, the Drake Award you had in the past and uh, what was the Drake Award for. Uh, some of our uh, viewers here are new; they have not had the opportunity to see and to hear your talks in the past. Uh, so, Bill. Um, you're a space scientist, you work at NASA Ames Research Center, and uh, I know you, I met you multiple times for this amazing, ex extraordinary mission it's called the NASA Kepler. So could you tell us a bit about um, the Kepler mission and why uh, you got awarded the Drake Award for this mission? Well, the Kepler mission is a, a rather modest mission that NASA flew uh, at a time when people didn't know there were or not, whether or not there were Earth-sized planets. Uh, it could be that uh, the giant planets destroyed all of them. Uh, maybe there weren't any small planets. Certainly nobody had found small planets orbiting a regular star, although a few were found around neutron stars. So uh, in the, starting about 1980, I wanted to develop a photometer that would allow us to find small Earth-sized planets in and near the habitable zone and I felt the way to do that was the photometry, which just measures the dimness, the change in the brightness of a star as it dims 
when a planet crosses it. So I spent many years at NASA doing research, trying to find out how to do that. Ultimately, we built a mission called the Kepler mission. Where we flew a, a, a one meter uh, aperture telescope and it looked at uh, some 170,000 stars and found something like 4,000 planets or planetary candidates and proved that uh, most stars, uh, most stars have planets. There are more planets than stars. There are quite a few small planets, Earth-sized planets, a fair number of them are in a habitable zone. And so the estimate is something like 10 or 30 billion small planets in and near the habitable zone of stars in our galaxy. Plenty of opportunities uh, for life to begin. One of the things uh, that we, we've tried to do is determine some of the factors in the Drake equation. The Drake equation is telling us uh, how many civilizations we might communicate with. And so there are a number of factors. One of the factors is how many stars have planets. And what we found, that's something like 50%. It's at least 50%. Many of these have several planets. And so we've got one of the factors taken care of. But another factor in the Drake equation is which of these planets, what fraction of these planets are habitable? Do they have an atmosphere? Do they have water? Do they have the things that are important to evolve life? And so the coming ground-based telescopes and space-based missions will seek to determine that factor. So I've been delighted that uh, I was, that I had a chance to receive the award. I certainly am so delighted because the people from the SETI Institute had contributed to the Kepler mission and the other missions that are doing this. Uh, and so it's sort of a, a mutual situation where we all win. We learn about exoplanets, we learn about the factors in the Drake equation, and someday we'll learn, I hope, actually communicate with some of these civilizations. Thank you, Bill. Yeah, we say that uh, I cannot start a talk about the exoplanet. I give you multiple talks over the years without talking about the Kepler mission and the revolution that brought this mission into our understanding of the universe, our, our Milky Way. It's, uh, it's a remarkable result that now we know that there is a planet almost around every star in our galaxy. Um, Vicky, now we know there is a planet. <laughs> You're the right person to tell us a bit more about um, those planets. You're an astrobiologist, a planetary astronomer. You study solar system bodies, solar system planets, but you do also study exoplanets. And um, one of your work is, uh, uh, is of being a principal investigator for the virtual planetary laboratory. And um, I would like you to tell us um, a bit more about your work and how this work led you to get the uh, Drake Award in 2018. Okay, so um, yeah, the 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 I, I got it for achievements in astrobiology, which is pretty broad. So I'll try and explain, you know, what what that is. But I mean, astrobiology is of course the study of life in the universe, and uh, so the Virtual Planetary Laboratory was founded actually twenty one years ago now. So I guess we're old enough to drink, uh, and uh, we are a group of people who. Um, are all dedicated to answering a single question, which is, you know, if we find an extrasolar planet, um, you know, a terrestrial planet orbiting around another star, you know, how can we tell whether that planet can support life or has life on it, which are in fact also two, two uh, uh, terms in the Drake equation as well. And so we have been doing theoretical modeling for a very long time now, two decades, um, to try and understand what it is we should look for, uh, you know, what characteristics of star and planet interactions will allow a planet to be habitable to maintain water on its surface uh, over time, uh, as well as trying to understand, you know, if we're looking for signs of life, which when we're looking at extrasolar planets over great distances, we're really talking about life's impact on its environment in a global way. So trying to understand how life will impact this environment, what we should look for, um, also how to not get fooled by, you know, typical non-life planetary processes, potentially producing the things that we might look for. Um, and so we're doing, we're sort of laying the scientific foundation for the time when we hope we'll actually be able to get observations of extrasolar planets and try to decipher whether or not they are habitable worlds and whether they have life on them. Um, and the good news is um, my, my team's motto for the longest time was planets are hard, uh, describing all of the different interactions that we'd have to take into account. Uh, but now our new motto is photons are coming. And that's because we have the James Webb Space Telescope up there, which is doing an absolutely fabulous job. It's, it's gone through all of its paces and it's working really, really well. 
And so as early as July, um, data are going to come down on a particular system um, called the TRAPPIST-1 system, which is uh, seven Earth-sized seven planets orbiting around a tiny little star um, that will allow us, you know, the geometry and the ratio of the star and planet sizes and everything will allow us to actually look for molecules in the atmospheres of those planets. And so uh, we, at the moment, within months, are kind of poised on a, a big transition in exoplanet science, the ability to potentially start to look for molecules on Earth-like planets in the habitable zone around other stars. And so, um, yeah, from the VPL standpoint, this is what we've been working for uh, all along. And so we're, we're very interested to see what will happen with that. Um, don't hold your breath though, because we're gonna have to integrate uh, lots and lots of transits to be able to get enough signal. So we're starting the search soon, but it'll take maybe a year or so, or a couple of years before we actually know what we're looking at. Uh, but nonetheless, a very exciting time to be able to, to do that. Um, and my team is also very much looking forward to um, the, the mission we are nicknaming LUVEX. Um, and that is the, you know, every 10 years, the astronomy community in the US goes through a process of trying to figure out which mission it should build next. Um, it's called the Decadal Survey. Um, and uh, the sort of the, the flagship for the Decadal Survey is the really exciting sort of big mission that's coming up. And that one will be a very large space-based uh, telescope uh, that will have the ability to block out the light from a parent star and be able to see Earth-like planets around it directly. So actually take a photograph, direct imaging of those planets. Um, and VPL is helping to understand again with that technique, what should we be looking for um, and how can we help people understand you know, it's one, it's one thing to detect a bias signature, but can we actually prove it's due to life and can we convince people uh, that we've actually found life um, on other worlds? So that's that's the research we're doing right now. That's a very good summary. You cover a lot of my questions, in fact. But <laughs> that's a good summary. We're going to go back to some of the points you mentioned. And um, what about you, Paul? You, Paul Rovitz, you received the Drake Award in 2021. I know you work for the research for technology called civilization. Uh, tell us a bit about uh, the reason for which you get the Sea World and what you what your research is about. Yeah, well, actually, it was it was shared. Um, there were two awardees uh, last year. Uh, oh, yes. I just was, met Dan, in fact, in the old way, like a few yeah, minutes yeah. ago. Sorry. Dan Ruth sure at that. Berkeley and myself at Harvard. And I sort of view us as click and clack the Tappet brothers of SETI um, on bicoastal. So we like building stuff. And um, I grew up in the physics community. I did some sort of conventional physics kinds of stuff. I worked with um, uh, X-ray microscopes and proton microscopes and crazy stuff, stuff like that. But I was under the spell of the great Edward Purcell. The picture actually behind me is the antenna that Purcell's graduate student and Purcell built, which was the first detection of spectral line radio astronomy on Earth in 1951. They saw hydrogen from the galaxy and that really got the field going. Um, Ed was a fan of SETI and gave a wonderful talk at Brookhaven, and I sort of remembered that. And when I became a junior faculty member here, um, Carl Sagan, who was at Harvard at that time, was teaching a course on life in the universe. And um, Frank Drake came and gave a little series about radio astronomy and wound up with a, a wonderful little lecture on SETI. And so when I had a sabbatical, um, I asked Frank if I could go look for life in Puerto Rico, as I put it. He was director of the um, RCB telescope at the time. He got the joke. He sent me there. He even sent me with some money. I didn't realize you could get paid for this stuff. Anyway, that led to, to a continuing career, and I became totally hooked on this. A little later, um, Jill Tarter uh, at NASA Ames um, invited me to come and spend a sabbatical there, and um, I met the great Charlie Seeger and Barney Oliver, and um, by this time, I was totally hooked. There's no going back. So um, on the East Coast, I was building a radio um, spectrometers with more and more channels, first 64,000 channels, then 8 million channels, then a quarter of a billion channels. Um, meanwhile, the, we were leapfrogging each other. Berkeley, with, Dan was building bigger ones and I was building bigger ones. Um, and then, well, we didn't find anything and then the big boys were moving in. So both Dan and I got interested in optical astronomy, optical study. Uh, Charlie Towns sort of led the charge on, on that with a wonderful paper in 1981, 81. Um, and so we've both been working on optical SETI since then. I had several uh, graduate students at Harvard who built some really neat telescopes. Um, and now we're working together uh, with Shelley Wright, who's this year's Drake Awardee, on a project called PanSETI, which is an all sky, all the time optical SETI involving some 100,000 little pixels of 
nanosecond speed detectors and a whole array of Fresnel uh, lens telescopes. And this is, we're working hard on this, expect to see some first light this summer. And when it's fully built, it'll see some five or 10,000 square degrees of the sky simultaneously all the time, that is nighttime. Unlike radio astronomies, we learned uh, at the beginning of the session, you can't do it in the daytime. We get to sleep <laughs> in the daytime. Thank you, Paul. Um, yeah, I, I want to remind our viewers, we have like 100 people watching us live right now. Uh, if you have any questions for, um, for our speakers here, our uh, panelists, please uh, post them on the Q&A. I will take the time to, uh, to ask a few of them. Um, so this year, the recipient of the Drake Award is Shelley Wright. Um, you mentioned Paul already uh, about, about Shelley. Do you, um, any of you can basically tell us a bit about the work of Shelley uh, in terms of the research you are doing? How is useful uh, the relationship you uh, you having with this research, uh, Bill? Do you want to start? Do you? I'm, I guess I missed your question. Uh, yeah. So Shelley is getting a, uh, an award, uh, the Drake Award this year for research into uh, uh, Oseti. Um, can you tell us how this research could be uh, useful in the now we know that exoplanets um, exist? Um, do, you, are you, uh, do you have, for instance, some particular interest in this kind of research? Do you, uh, have you communicating to Shelley about some work done in the past? Well, one of the, sir, uh, wonderful that there are a number of ways now people are searching for extraterrestrial intelligence. When Frank Drake started out, it was a radio telescope. And as uh, uh, Horowitz was mentioned, only a, a small number of, of channels. Uh, what we have seen, uh, as Paul mentions, now you, you talk about billions of channels. I don't think we're quite there in optical uh, SETI, but I think we're moving rapidly in that direction. So we, we're, I think, doing the right thing. Uh, Kepler can tell us, and the, the telescopes can tell us that certain planets exist, uh, but certainly what would solve the situation, is there life out there, would be to pick up that signal, to pick up the signal of uh, communicating civilization. So I think SETI and the various methods it's trying is really, uh, to me, a very delightful change as we moved on to more capable systems. Okay. Um, so I have a question here from, some, from a, a viewer. Um, you all have different, the three of you have different type of, uh, different type of astronomer. Uh, how do you call yourself? Uh, are you instrumentalist? Are you uh, theorist? Are you observers? Um, a lot of young people have a hard time understanding how astronomy works. So maybe Paul or Vicky, can you tell us how you basically, if someone asks you, you're an astronomer, how do you, basically, how do you simplify your work in one word? <laughs> oh, um, so, so, so yes, I am a type of astronomer. Um, you know, I, I was trained as an observer, as you noted, I, I have observed Venus and Earth uh, within the solar system and studied them. So I'm a little bit of everything. I'd say I'm an astrobiologist. That would be the one word um, that I would use. Um, and that talks about the interdisciplinarity of, of the field that we are in and the fact that, you know, the search for life is really the driving scientific goal of the research that I do. Um, but, you know, I'm also a theoretician. I, I work with computer models all the time, uh, but those computer models are in the service of observations. We are simulating observations, trying to understand what we should look for so that we can use our telescopes efficiently when we do. But, you know, so I'm both an observer and a theoretician. Um, so, but and an you, Paul? Thank you, uh, Vicky. Well, people ask me sometimes, I usually say I was, I was trained as a physicist. I drifted into electrical engineering and I'm doing astronomy. Um, I guess, and it's kind of true, all those things are true. Um, it's nice to be able to use tools from one field uh, into another. Sometimes it gives you a perspective that people in the field don't have. Um, it also is a lot of fun. So yeah. I, I also, can I just say something about Shelley because um, you mentioned okay. Shelley, right? And Shelley, Shelley has been a pioneer in the infrared or the near infrared SETI. Um, and why, why is infrared interesting? It's interesting because the galaxy is full of dust. And if you people watch this morning's EHT, wonderful event, those pictures of stars swinging around the black hole at the center of the galaxy were done in the near infrared. 
You can't do that in the visible because there's too much extinction. Um, so if I were an extraterrestrial civilization and I were following Charlie Towns, the inventor of the laser, won the Nobel Prize for that, if I were following his instructions, I would be looking in the infrared. And it's kind of unreasonable to expect that, that other civilizations will be sending us signals at all wavelengths. They're probably going to pick something that's kind of good for that job. And that might well be infrared. And Towns' comment was, um, radio has been the method that's been going on for um, 30 or 40 years when he wrote that paper. But when you look at the figure of merit of received signal per amount of stuff sent, optical is really competitive with radio techniques for interstellar stuff. So Shelley has done the infrared, she's done the targeted search um, at the Nickel Telescope on Lick Observatory, and she's now the head, she's running this new project called Panacetti that I described before, which is a collaboration between Berkeley, Caltech, UCSD, and Harvard. Okay. What about you, um, Bill? How do you call yourself as an astronomer? Or... One of the things that Ames allows is a more general term. And so I was a space scientist. As such, one of the things I could do was look at the problems that were of interest to NASA. What are its strategic goals? Is there something I could contribute to that? And so I recognized that if we were going to explore space, find other civilizations, the first thing we had to do was prove there were Earth-sized planets in a habitable zone. If there aren't any, there is no Star Trek, there is no need to look. So given that that's the problem, it's a matter of, at least for me, well, develop an instrument to do the job. So first comes the question, then comes the development of an instrument to, to solve the problem and get the answer. And so I sort of look at myself as a problem solver. I've, I've worked with computer models of the Earth's climate. I have built uh, systems that look at the shock layer in a re-entering vehicle from the carrying astronauts. Uh, as a space scientist, I've done a lot of different projects, but generally we have a problem. Can we solve the problem? Can we accomplish this goal? And my goal really is from just that. If we, let's look at important problems, let's solve them. Thank you, problem solver, love this one. Um, so uh, we're gonna play a game here. I have a bunch of questions, but, and I would like you to answer to, I would like to take as many questions as possible. So I'm gonna assign the question to one of you, okay? And you're gonna give me a brief answer, is that okay? So the first question I have um, is about the importance of the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico. And someone is asking if we should build it or not. And I'm assigning, assigning these questions to Paul. Oh boy. Well, you know, there's a little bit of, there's more aspects to that than just the science, um, which is, you know, it, it was a wonderful facility. It was built in, in the early 60s. It was upgraded um, some decade later. Um, but it was outclassed by more recent arrays, such as the Meerkat in South Africa. It's not clear that one should build a large single dish aperture anymore. The advantages of rays are that you can have multiple beams at the same time with the full sensitivity of the combined area. Uh, there, I know that there's a planning group at Arecibo trying to decide what the next generation Arecibo would be. And what they're looking at right now are arrays of dishes. So probably the right answer is you don't rebuild Arecibo the way it was, but you build something which takes advantage of contemporary techniques in beam forming and signal processing to build something of even better capability. Okay. Yeah, today we have seen that uh, with uh, basically an array of millimeter uh, antennas, we can get an image of a black hole. So maybe instead of building a large dish uh, in Arecibo, in Puerto Rico, it would be a better idea to build a cluster of small dishes that would be part of the um, ETH, for instance. But that's an idea. The second question I got is for Bill. Bill. Uh, could you explain in a, in a few words why Cygnus, the area of the sky, was chosen as a target area for Kepler? Kepler wants to find Earth-sized planets around stars like our sun. The galaxy is full of all sorts of stars, including small red little stars. 
but we'd like to find them around G doors, like our own sun. Now, where do you look where there's a lot of stars so that you can look at a lot of possible planets? So you're going to have a rich area of stars, and you don't want to look where the sun crosses your field of view or planets cross your field of view. So you want to stay away from those areas. Finally, of course, uh, there is the, uh, so you want to be close to the plane of the Milky Way because there's lots of stars there. But if you're really close to the, you know, right in the Milky Way, you're, it's full of these giant stars. And you can't find little planets around giant stars very readily. So basically, we found some regions of the sky where it was rich in stars like our sun and not going to be interfered with by planets and the sun and, and, and the earth. So basically, that sort of said the Cygnus area was, was the prime area for us. OK. Um, a question for Vicky. Uh, Vicky, I'm sorry, but uh, we have a lot of questions about JWST, of course. Okay. So <laughs> people want to hear uh, you plan. I know you mentioned it already, but some more detailed plans about JWST and the use of the Space Telescope for exoplanet and detecting uh -huh. biomarkers. Okay. Oh, so for, for biomarkers, there are some questions about SETI as well, which I could also potentially address um, there. I don't know if you're saving that up for later. But yeah, so so again, the James Webb Space Telescope uses, um, it's, a, it's a very large collecting area. It allows us to see planets transiting in front of their star as the planet transits in front. Uh, you basically backlight the atmosphere, that thin blue line um, around the planet. And so we're able to see molecules in the atmosphere blocking out light from the star um, as the planet passes in front of us. So we only get to see that transit. We get to, we get to try and detect those molecules only for the duration that the, the planet is, front of, is in front of the star. And that's the same technique that Bill uses with Kepler to, you know, to see things. Um, and so, yeah, we were using that technique um, to look for molecules in the atmosphere. Uh, our favorite biosignature look, to look for with JWST is not oxygen because JWST is not good at that, um, which is a bit disappointing, but, uh, you know, because that's, obviously one of the really big ones because there's a lot of it in our atmosphere, but we could potentially look for the signs of carbon dioxide and methane seen together because those two molecules seen together would tend to destroy each other. The fact that we see them together means that there's a constant flux of methane into the atmosphere. Um, and we know very few, uh, very few geological uh, 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 processes that would actually produce a lot of methane on our planet life produces way more methane than the, the geology does. And so that's what we'd be looking for. So that's that's biosignatures. Uh, but somebody also asked about SETI. Um, and so people have actually looked into whether we could see chlorofluorocarbons mm -hmm. on, uh, on these planets. Um, and it turns out that would actually be really, really challenging. Um, and again, I always make the joke about if a civilization is pumping chlorofluorocarbons into its atmosphere, is it really intelligent life? So um, the, the question is that, that, you know, if, can we see these particular complex molecules? They would in fact be very challenging. Um, but there's one other thing we can do, and I know Jill Tarter likes to, to talk about this one and looking for SETI with JWST, is, you know, if we look at the seven planets of the TRAPPIST-1 system, and they all have very similar properties, uh, as in surface temperatures, for example, even though they're different distances from their stars, then that might speak to some kind of geoengineering on those planets, uh, you know, the, the, having the, the actual planetary system be engineered in such a way that it is uh, an, a nice environment for a particular type of bi bi biology. So we could also potentially look for that as well as a sign of, of a technological civilization working on them. Thank you. Okay, so now I have two questions and I want to ask those two questions to the three of you. Um, the first one, so brief answer, please. Uh, if I give you $10 billion right now, and I tell you, you need to use this money to do something in astronomy, what will you do? Paul, you want to start? That's, that's a softball because that's, that's just a, a bit more than we need to complete the complete Pan SETI observatory. And I take the money and run. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Bill? Kepler generated a huge amount of data. Uh, the small planets, the planets that we particularly like to see are buried in some of that, that data. I'd love to see uh, an AI approach looking for those planets, small planets in, an, in our noisy data. Do you think you need $10 billion for that? You could do that for cheaper than this, right? 
we're talking about a very difficult problem. Okay. You're trying to find these this this noisy signal, in I'm sorry this this little signal in very noisy data, and you don't have a lot of it. I think Vicky mentioned the planet passes across the star in a fairly short time, so that's when we get our data, not other times. So mm -hmm. I think that a serious effort uh, might very well find more Earth-sized planets in a habitable zone of of the stars. You know, it's the data is there. We just haven't found the signals yet. What about you, Vicky? Oh, that's easy. So I would add that budget, that 10 billion to the existing 11 billion that's going to be set aside for the LUVEX telescope, and I would make it really bigger, uh, which would mean that instead of getting 25 potentially habitable planets that we try to look for life on, we can at least double, uh, possibly even you know triple that number, which will give us a much bigger statistical chance of actually detecting life um, with that. So instead of building a, you know an inscribed six meter diameter telescope, we could potentially push out to like 12 or 15. Um, and so that is what I would do with that. Okay. All right, good question, good answer to the three of you. Okay, and now my question a bit more like general. What is exciting you the most in the field of science and research at the moment? What do you think the young person who's interested in science should be working on? It doesn't have to be about astronomy, it could be anything. And uh, we'd like to start with you, Vicky. Okay, um, I, 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 think, I think what we're doing is the most exciting thing, which is of course why I'm here and that's why I'm biased. But I think the fact that we now have targets that are identified, um, thank you to Bill and also to the ground-based people who've been finding these targets, um, we now have targets identified for which we can start the search for life. And so I think we've now come to this very special time in human history where our technology and our knowledge have met and we are now about to take spectra of terrestrial exoplanets and to try and understand whether or not they have life on them. And, and I think that's, you know, every, everything to do with that and supporting that um, uh, field, I think, is, is the most exciting thing at the moment. Good. Uh, Bill, do you want to answer to this question? It's a great question. Uh, what we're trying to do is find life in the universe. One of the places to start is our solar system. We have space missions that are on design on a planning board to go to some of the moons where water is erupting from underground ocean, uh, under, uh, under ice covered oceans and sample that water and see if there are any biological molecules there. We have also an effort, of course, on Mars to look for life. So the most exciting thing to me is, will we find life in our solar system other than on Earth? If the answer is yes, probably got a lot of life throughout, the, uh, throughout our galaxy. If we don't find any on these moons, we don't find any on Mars. I think that's sort of worrisome, it's, it's a downer. So I would like to see uh, this effort uh, uh, improved, expanded to look for life in our own solar system. Thank you. And Paul? Uh, I'll probably get murdered for this, but you know, with, there's a lot of excitement in astronomy these days. There's LIGO, there's the Event Horizon Telescope, there's what Bill just mentioned, which is life on moons in the planetary, in our planetary system or on Mars. Um, but you know, I think, I think the last century was the century of physics. I think this century is the century of biology. So although I probably shouldn't say it, I think going into something having to do with the human genome and its implications for human health and so on would be very attractive to a young person. I'm gonna get killed for this. I hope nobody's <laughs> no, listening. I think it's good that there is different type of science and we work in different fields and we make progress all together. It could be astronomy, biology, yes. particle physics. At the end, finding the truth is really what matters to any scientist, right? So we work together. We work together. As a team, we're ever so much stronger than any individual. We've been here for more than 36 years, at the forefront of a quest that many consider science fiction. To understand the prevalence of life in the universe, because the discovery of life beyond Earth will lay the framework for humanity's next steps to the stars. We are the SETI Institute.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. How are you all doing? I feel the need to preface this with the fact that I practice radical transparency and honesty. And the reason I had to say that is because my contact lens, <laughs> my contact lens has decided to not work. My text is this small because when I was trying to print at the hotel, the Wi-Fi wouldn't work for me. Nothing worked for me. And it's really interesting because last week I was having a conversation with my colleague at Arizona State University who does research on how people of color don't find out the information they need from Google, being able to access Wi-Fi, being able to do everything. And I'm like, I'm a person of privilege. That doesn't apply to me. And I got, and I, and I got here yesterday and basically I couldn't get in, and I have a two-year-old with me and I didn't have a car seat because I couldn't carry it because I'm a single mom, and I wasn't able to get on any ride. I've been stressed as hell trying to make it here, and I'm like, this is crazy. So I don't know how the people who are not privileged survive because I'm standing here frazzled as hell. Okay, so. <laughs> So I did prepare some opening remarks this morning in between managing my dad who came with me and like multi-generational management and trying to shop for what we're supposed to wear because I'm like, what do you wear around here? And I found out that it's like, I don't know, there's like all these codes and stuff that I couldn't figure out. So I've been all over the place. I had to wake up and find some time to write my speech. But I have been thinking about it for the last week. Right, like just ruminating and, and this is what I came up with. So, as an assistant professor and space governance researcher at Arizona State University, I can only speak at a superficial level about the work that SETI has undertaken and the people that we are here to celebrate. The search for extraterrestrial intelligence, SETI, seeks to answer the big question are we alone in this unbelievably vast universe? It provides an existential, philosophical, technical, and even religious challenge. SETI began in the 1960s, expanding to the founding of the SETI Institute in 1984, where, amongst other things, they partnered with the University of California at Berkeley to construct an array of radio telescopes to scan the cosmos for signs of intelligent life even though in recent years there's been a focus on non-intelligent life or microbiobial life. I was at the MIT Media Lab last month for a transdisciplinary conference where I gave the opening talk on a panel on democratizing access to space. I brought up the Drake Award recipients to some of the NASA scientists that I met, and I defer here to their expertise for my understanding. So UC San Diego astrophysicist Shelley Wright's work is designed to detect pulses of light in the infrared from an advanced civilization out amongst the stars. This is a technological search for discovering another technologically active life. In a place like this, Menlo Park, this seems like a breakthrough, maybe the start of a fearfully exciting future. NASA is even beginning to soften its stance for looking for technology out there, recognizing that the search for techno-signatures raises the level, as only a technological civilization can produce techno-signatures. And techno-signatures, simply put, is the study of the effects of technology on an environment. But not everyone shares that optimism. As an environmental lawyer with a postdoc in climate change, I can already tell you all about the effects of technology on the environment. Do we even need to go to deep space for that? So in discussing with an indigenous planetary scientist at a conference at McGill, McGill University in Canada last week where I was, I learned that we make assumptions of how technological cultures evolve. Those assumptions are largely derived from beliefs and experiences of Western societies. And this is problematic considering the diversity that we have in the world. I myself am a product of Western societies, 
British by birth, Canadian by choice, American by permanent residence. And what is evidence to me are the teachings of Western philosopher Foucault, who touched upon discipline and how society can be conditioned without even knowing it. The understanding of the far-reaching and frightening prospect of this is fundamental to the goal of social transformation because it highlights how all concepts or ideas for social transformation can be used in the negative sense to either maintain the status quo or create change for the worst, depending on who is looking for the change. The only symbol or relic I can use to judge Shelley's work is the institution she is part of. I'm currently listening to an audiobook called Reinventing Organizations by Frederick Lacau, and I'm listening to it in French. My French is terrible. <laughs> what I'm learning is that as fallible as the notion of institution is, it is a symbol that we can use to reach consensus, common understanding, and to prioritize. Shelley's great discovery was at the University of Toronto, a city I was at yesterday, where unfortunately I spent all day at the airport. It's an institution I trust on the surface as a proud Canadian of nine years, because I know many great products of that institution. My sister just got matched to the medical school there. As the University of Toronto published in March 2015 in the Dunlop Institute for Astronomy and Astrophysics, Shelley and her colleagues came up with the groundbreaking instrument, Neuroseti, the first capable of detecting extremely short, extremely bright pulses of infrared light. This work was, of course, on the back of others, including Charles Towns of UC Berkeley. This award ceremony that we are all at today, the Drake Awards, is named after Frank Drake. So building on and acknowledging on the work of giants makes us realize that we cannot achieve any advancements without the community that we build. This can be difficult to develop unless we learn from the wisdom of traditional societies. As an African, specifically with Nigerian heritage, the sense of value and legacy is inherent in how I was raised. My dad is here, my daughter is here, and the adage, it takes a village, is one I can attest to. This is why it is not only important to celebrate the next generation through the undergraduate SETI Forward Award sponsored by the Berkeley SETI Research Center and the REU Award for Excellence, but also the internal work that the SETI community is doing through its employees and associates through the Carl Sagan Center Director Award sponsored by Amesh Kolopara. By celebrating all these contributions, the desire is to show that focusing on the hero model is old school. Teamwork makes the dream work. Now going back to the double edge of assumptions that the indigenous scholar told me about, we look at people doing pure SETI as a subset of astrobiology, but they are pioneers and visionaries because of the assumptions that they've made. For instance, including that there are lots of Earth-like planets, and now science has proven that habitable planets are plentiful. We are here today to recognize that the challenges that humanity faces needs more scientists and engineers tackling big challenge problems. But the lone genius scientist is a thing of the past. By celebrating all these contributions we are doing today, the desire is to show that focusing on the hero model, the old white male, is old school. As ASU planetary scientist and PI of the Psyche mission, Lindy Elkins Tanton asks in her Issues in Science and Technology piece, is it time to say goodbye to our heroes? The hero model describes the structure underlying most of the research done in the United States. But to deal with the human and environmental urgencies of the next 75 years, we need a structure that can create knowledge where we need it, enable faster adoption of innovations, and enable broad participation on every axis, including gender, socioeconomic background, race, nationality, and across disciplines. Now is the moment, she says, to reimagine research 
for the greatest use of resources, the greatest use of all human minds, and the greatest progress into the most positive possible futures. At the School for the Future of Innovation and Society at Arizona State University, where I am, we use the rather unsatisfactory phase that the future is for everyone. We can be hopeful that the power of the imagination opens up new realms beyond the lives we live at the moment, but we must recognize our subjectivity and privilege to be in a position to even believe that we have the agency to make those imaginations real. So this is how the event will start. I was supposed to introduce Jill Tarter to, to introduce the three SETI Forward Awards, but she's not here. We will then transition to the CSC Director Award introduced by Natalie Cabral. We will then tr transition to the Drake Award introduced by Bill Diamond with a surprise video. And then the award recipients will make their remarks before we close out with Mr. Drake himself. In the spirit of community, we will invite all participants to come on the stage to symbolize that the hero model has morphed into one where the sense of community is centralized. Does that sound good? Okay. Now, I am just a hired gun, a simple host, so some of the stuff I read out may be scripted, so don't blame me if there's stuff that you don't like. But if I feel a vibe, I will insert my radical transparency and honesty into it. So hopefully everyone will leave here feeling like they got the real deal. OK, so I believe, have we had the, have we had the Morgan Freeman video? OK, perfect. We've done the opening remarks. Check. OK. I'm trying to follow instructions here. OK, so the interesting thing that we're doing now is we're talking about the SETI Forward Award, right? OK, I can read. OK, the SETI Forward Award is supported by an endowment established in 2018 by SETI Institute trustee Dane Glasgow, numerous other trustees, and the program's founder, Lou Levy, who is going to join us here on stage. Each year, dozens of students worldwide intern with SETI and astrobiology scientists, but too many pivot to other fields, resulting in too few talented researchers focusing on the search for life beyond Earth. The SETI Forward Award allows us to pay it forward to help bridge the gap between their internship experiences and the careers in, their, in these crucial fields. I will introduce Lou to the stage. Um, thank you for your leadership, and I invite you to present the, this year's recipients. Hello, everyone. So, in 2017, I impossibly helped to put a crowdfunding effort over the top. Uh, US, at UC Berkeley, they were trying to send a student to a conference and they were seeking some funds and I saw it was within my reach to put it over the top and I just decided, why not? That impulse led to forming an annual Berkeley Travel Award and eventually SETI Forward, which somehow leads to me standing up here in front of you. <laughs> the students being recognized here did not get where they are on impulsive decisions, but on a dedication to their future careers. And to answer a question that was just asked, I think of SETI Forward as reaching out to the people that are undergraduates to try and give them an impetus to follow this, to follow SETI, to follow astrobiology, to become ambassadors to the overall field and to help with the answer to the great question, are we alone? So it's my pleasure to begin tonight's award presentation by introducing Rafi Tross. Rafi is an undergraduate at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse studying astrophysics and applied math. Rafi is being honored for his multi-year techno-signature research with Dr. Steve Croft of the Berkeley SETI Research Center and Breakthrough Listen. His work culminated in the first author publication in the Astronomical Journal. Rafi plans to study cosmology in graduate school and someday help advance the work of the Philippine Space Agency. Congratulations, Rafi.
Wow, thank you. <laughs> well, first of all, I'd like to thank the SETI Institute and the SETI Forward Award. It means a lot to me. And to answer a previous question, it means a lot to me to receive this award because um, it's one of my goals to help, as, you, as uh, Lou was talking about, to help progress the Philippine Space Agency. Um, so I'm, I'm from the Philippines. I was adopted when I was two, and I, there's been a disconnect, at least for the, my entire life, where like I have been living a better life, but I, how do I give back? And with radio astronomy, and with working with uh, the Berkeley SETI Research Center, I found that it's a very multifaceted, multidisciplinary, international cooperation. And ever since then, it's kind of been like, it fueled the idea that I might be able to pay it forward and fulfill this dream through radio astronomy and through working with SETI. And so this, that's what this award means to me, and it means a lot. And I'd like to thank my friends and family for the support throughout my journey, as well as I'd like to thank um, the research collaborators and my mentor, Steve Croft, and everyone else at the Berkeley Center Research Center who's um, created a, a community for me to learn, but also has inspired me to try to create a community like that somewhere else or in places where there might not be a community like that. And so um, with that, I, I thank you. Thank you, Rafi. Congratulations. So one of the reasons why we named SETI Forward, SETI Forward, was some of the things that Rafi just discussed. The desire to pay things forward. Back when I was young in my career, I had people help me by sending me to conferences or giving me roles at conferences, which gave me great connections, great networking. And this is somewhat a way of paying that forward and back to the people that you see in front of you today. One of the things we like to do with SETI Forward is recognize that the search for life encompasses both technology and biology. I very much look forward to the day we discover biology outside of Earth's biosphere. It's people like our next award recipient who are on the path to understanding the foundations of life. It is my pleasure to introduce Zoe Weiss. Zoe is an undergraduate at Harvard University studying chemical and physical biology and mathematics. And she's an undergraduate researcher in the Shostak lab, yes, I had to Google that pronunciation, <laughs> investigating the evolutionary transition from RNA enzymes functioning in prebiotic conditions to more modern enzymes. Her joint computational and experimental analysis collectively reveal how RNA functions are interconnected in sequence space and illuminate viable paths towards the evolutionary diversification of RNA enzymes. And Zoe, I'm very glad you understand what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> After college, she hopes to pursue an MD and PhD to become a quantitative physician scientist. Congratulations, Zoe. Thank you. I grew up playing with Legos, clicking together the green, blue, and yellow bricks with general carelessness, yet precision, and fearlessness, yet slight panic every time a small crease on the skin on my fingers got caught between the two bricks. Playing with Legos has afforded me a love of creation, of discovery. But at first, there was no discovery. If you have two of the four by two bricks, there's a very finite number of ways to snap them together, which I'm sure every other kid did before me. Using inorganic chemistry lingo, if we account for E, C2, sigma, and I symmetries, the two bricks fit together only in four ways. The beauty of Legos came from me when the complexity increased, above the point where it was statistically likely that some other kid could have made what I made. I became addicted to this feeling of discovery. Now, many years out of my Lego phase, not much has changed. I'm an undergraduate researcher in an origins of life biochemistry lab. The Legos, which snap together to form new shapes, are now reagents, amino imidazoles, nucleotides, phosphates, which react to form new products and give us hints about the path that evolution may have taken using the building blocks that astrobiology has uncovered. I, like 
many philosophers, scientists, astrobiologists, and most people for thousands of years and fascinated by how life began. And we now have the tools to tackle this question. A major challenge is how RNA could have been replicated chemically before enzymes evolved. And my research investigates how primitive RNA could have functioned as both a genetic material and a mechanism to self-replicate in prebiotic conditions. I'm really, really thankful to SETI for this award because it encourages me and countless other researchers interested in some of the biggest questions of life and of our universe to continue to think unexpectedly, creatively, and fearlessly. Thank you. So personally, I'm fascinated by the organic material discovered on so many of our remote bodies in our solar system. I mean, who before New Horizons could have imagined finding organic material on Pluto, and yes, Pluto is a planet, <laughs> with the potential for an underground ocean. <laughs> it clears its space. <laughs> okay. <It'll laughs> um, it's my pleasure to introduce our final award recipient this evening, Mary Claire Greenlees. Mary Claire studies astrophysics at Bernard College. She worked with Dr. Christina Daly Orr and Dr. Rachel Mistrapa using Cassini VIMS data to determine whether organic material, aromatic or aliphatic, is present on Saturn's satellite Rhea. Congratulations, Mary Claire. Thank you. I'm incredibly honored to be awarded this award. My summer at the SETI, this summer I spent as an RU student at the SETI Institute working with Dr. Christina Dai Orr and Dr. Rachel Mastrapa. Together we analyzed the presence of organic material on Saturn's icy moon Rhea as part of a larger survey of Saturn's icy satellites. During our work, we came to unexpected conclusions and I became fascinated with analyzing all the possibilities as to why Rhea had little to no organic material unlike other moons such as Iapetus. I realized through this research my interest in studying the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, and I'm excited to see where that takes me in the future. I will forever cherish my memories from the summer, ranging from exploring the Bay Area with my fellow RU students, sitting at my cubicle at SETI, listening to all the fascinating lecturers um, from research scientists here at the Institute, and seeing a volcano for the first time. On Wednesday, I graduate from Barnard College with a degree in astrophysics, and I can't wait to see what the future has in store for me. The SETI Institute has provided me the tools to become not only a su successful researcher, but a lifelong learner. I'm excited to use what I've learned um, entering the workforce, studying design as a tool for planetary science education, and I hope to use the tools that I, I learned at the SETI Institute in graduate school later in the future. Through this research, I have strengthened both my skills and data analysis and expanded my knowledge of the solar system. Thank you so much to the SETI Institute REO program and all its supporters, the National Science Foundation and my mentors especially, for supporting my love of planetary science. And I'm happy for all of you to be part of my journey as a future scientist. Thank you. Again, congratulations to all the SETI Forward recipients. And... I still can't see, and thank you for offering me reading glasses. <laughs> so just listening to those students, that was really interesting, because I related with what Rafi said, because I started my career as a lawyer at the Nigerian Space Agency. I was born in England, I've moved, I lived in France, I lived in all these different places. And when you're this kind of nomad or you've moved around, you have this identity crisis, like where do you belong and everything. And I think it's interesting that his words talked about looking for community and looking for that sense of giving back to the Philippines, even though he's American. Like we, as immigrants, we battle this feeling of where do you belong? And he obviously has found community here at SETI. With respect to Zoe, the interesting things that reached out to me was her talking on the one hand about an addiction to discovery, which didn't sound very healthy to me, <laughs> um, with also thinking fearlessly, which I think 
is really brave in America because this country is so toxic. Everybody is running around scared to death. It's everywhere you go, if you, if you really listen to what's on the TV, what you see, it's all toxic. And it's just, they're just trying to breed fear into everyone. So for an undergrad student to be able to stand up and you know recognize the things in her that drove her to where she is, but needing to be fearless, is a really great quality to have at such a young age. So that's probably why she deserves that award. And then Mary talking about entering the workforce, you know, and she was very practical in what she was saying, which really is really an interesting point and perspective because these kind of topics we feel are so theoretical and academic. You don't really think of people talking workforce and talking, when I hear workforce, I think about impact and economic and e economics and all these things, and it's like, I would have never thought of that if I thought for a bunch of weirdos looking for aliens. <laughs> okay, now I'm all messed up in my notes. I believe that we're going on to the Carl Sagan Center Award. Okay, I keep, okay, you were supposed to have it up on the screen. <laughs> I need to look professional here. Okay, so the Carl Sagan Center is the research arm of the SETI Institute. Okay, now I'm just reading this for the first time and I thought the whole thing was a research institute, so I'm wondering what's the difference between a research arm and a non-research arm, so someone should probably clarify that. With over 100 principal investigators organized under six research areas, and while all doing fantastic and exciting work, tonight the Institute presents the recipient of the 2022 Carl Sagan Directors Award. And I believe that Natalie, I don't know if she's the director, but she's going to introduce this award. So Natalie is an astrobiologist, oh yeah, and a director of the SETI, I should have read this beforehand, <laughs> and a director of the SETI Institute's Carl Sagan Center for Research. Her research focuses on the exploration of habitability and life beyond Earth, work that takes her from extreme environments such as the high Andes where conditions are analogous to early Mars. Natalie is a prolific writer and lecturer, the recipient of many professional awards, and holds the women's world record for diving at high altitude. Well, as of this morning, I was still the director, yes, Bill? <laughs> well, we're talking about the importance of mentoring students. Tonight, I just heard from a very proud dad that one of our REU students is uh, graduating, getting her PhD in planetary science in a few days. So uh, congrats to the REU program, because obviously this was an inspiration, and keep mentoring young students, because this is the future of what we are doing. But tonight I'm here to, uh, well, we are still, you know, forever students. And tonight I'm, we're here to honor uh, Doug Caldwell. And uh, um, Doug is one of the hundred uh, research scientists that we have at the Institute. And as you know, uh, we are looking at absolutely the breadth of the Drake equation from uh, the uh, uh, origin uh, of the universe to the origins of life and then to uh, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. So, um, Doug, tonight I, I, I want to uh, honor you, but it's on the behalf of everybody at the SETI Institute, your peers. Uh, your name came so often that it was really a no-brainer for, for me to give you this award this year. I would say that there are so very few things that really fascinate people, such as, you know, the search for ET or dinosaurs, but the search for, extra, uh, for exoplanet in the past two decades is ranking pretty up high here. Uh, what we do have is a complete revolution in, astro in astronomy. So uh, I'm going to have tried to dug a little dirt on you. It's been really, really difficult, but I got something and I, want, I would like to talk a little. 
So, Doug, you are an astrophysicist. Uh, you, you work uh, uh, in astronomy and especially in optical and inf infrared uh, uh, astronomy and in star formation and exoplanet detection. But let's face it, uh, uh, you really like building and testing stuff. This is uh, what you do. So that goes from optical CCD instrument definitions, design, testing, characterization and calibration. But if I my understanding is correct, you actually started your career at the Naval Surface Warfare Center as engineering support and anomaly analysis. So I don't know what the anomaly stands for, but I'm just glad you are not doing any of that stuff around the new building. <laughs> so Doug, you came at the SETI Institute three years uh, after me. I've seen you uh, all around for all that time. And this year will be your 20th anniversary. So congratulations. <laughs> And, and in that time, you have accomplished very, very much uh, from uh, you have been at the forefront of exoplanet exploration and particularly at the interface between instrumentation, hardware and data analysis. Prior to the launch of Kepler in March 2009, you led the characterization of the photometer and uh, the creation of the calibration model. You participated in instrument testing at NASA Ames and Ball Aerospace and analyzed data and provided instrument performance updates to the project and the science team. You worked to assess the risk for mission anomalies and covering during testing to resolve anomalies where possible and to model the scientific impact and those which were deemed too costly to, risk to fix. You provided science support during the development and design phase of the Kepler mission as part of the wonderful collaboration we have between NASA Ames and the SETI Institute. And I think that I've seen some of your accomplices in the, in the room here, John Jenkins and uh, 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 Eric. Uh, 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 so, um, you also, uh, back on Earth, uh, you are the principal, you were the principal investigator for a telescope to search for transiting uh, exosolar planet from the South Pole uh, during two uh, international deployment. And you are right now a pipeline support scientist for the NASA Transiting Exoplanet Survey uh, uh, satellite test. And uh, what I really like is that what you are doing, the Test Science Processing Operations Center acronym is Spock. So this is Mr. Spock. <laughs> and where you do that, you are involved in, in taking the data from the spacecraft and take the pixel, the images, all these stars and measure their brightness and search through the measurement for transiting planets. So you send the data back to the, uh, uh, to the scientists, but also to citizen science. So uh, good on you. Again, you have ach achieved a lot. And um, I just would like to say on behalf of the Science Council, on behalf of the scientists of the SETI Institute, and uh, also of the management here at the, uh, 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 present here today, that it is my privilege tonight to award you the Carl Sagan uh, Director's Award, which is in recognition of outstanding achievements in the field of exoplanet exploration, exceptional contribution to the Kepler and K2 mission as instrument scientists and works in the Test Science Processing Operations Center, as well as a long commitment to excellence and service to the science community at the SETA Institute. So thank you so very thank much. You. And look, yeah. better than the Olympics. Wow. Okay. Congratulations. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't know. Cool. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very honored, Natalie, to be receiving this award, especially knowing all the great things that all the other scientists at the SETI Institute are doing. Um, I feel especially privileged to have started working in this field of exoplanets um, when it was really just at the beginning of a, what's turned out to be an explosion of activity and, and creativity. Um, I started in uh, 1999 on the Kepler mission, um, and uh, at the time, there were 31 exoplanets or, or planets orbiting stars other than our own that were known. And um, they're shown here on this, on this image of the, of the Milky Way. And the, the image is not a picture of the Milky Way. It's actually data from, from the European Space Agency's Gaia mission. It's the measurements of, of the positions and the brightnesses and the approximate colors of over a billion stars shown on the galaxy. Um, and that number sort of becomes important later. But so 1999, we knew about 31 exoplanets. Um, the Kepler mission had been under design and consideration for several years at that point already. 
Um, I started working on it, and it got approved by NASA in uh, 2000 or 2001, I think, for, for, to initially start actually building. So in, in the interim, uh, in the interest of time, I won't go through all the details of every year since then, but um, <laughs> in the interim, over the past 20 years, there have been a lot of people, a huge community that's growing and growing and growing, working on extrasolar planets. And where we stand today is there are over 5,000 confirmed planets around other stars. Um, <laughs> And, and they're, they're everywhere, and, and I, I had some help in this. I didn't find them all personally, um, so I, I, you know, there were some other people that helped. Um, but the, the amazing thing is that you know, once we started looking and knowing how to do this, we, we were seeing exoplanets everywhere. Um, and I, was, I, again, was very privileged to have been a part of this and to have some small hand in the discovery of, of a significant fraction of these, um, which were found through this transiting method where they pass in front of their star as seen from the Earth. And so we see the shadow of the planet. And from that, we're able to measure its size and its orbital period. And from that, we can get more information about how hot the planet might be when we know about the star. So to, to look at uh, the planets that I've sort of been involved in somewhat, um, primarily through the Kepler mission, uh, which is responsible for more than 3,200 of these 5,000 planets that are known so far. It was amazingly successful. And, and Kepler, the, the Kepler planets here are shown in magenta, Kepler and K2, which was a follow-on mission to Kepler. And you can, you can see the, the really dense spot of planets in the right there in the shape of a cross, and that's the, Kepler's, the shape of Kepler's detectors on the sky. Um, and there are over uh, 2,000, I believe, planets in that cross. And then the other magenta string of planets going across the sky are from the K2 mission, which was observing in, in our ecliptic plane, which cuts a swath across the Milky Way when plotted in these coordinates. And so those are different pointings of this Kepler mission. Um, since then, we've been working on the, the TESS mission, which was the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, was launched in 2018 to do an all-sky survey to find the planets around the stars nearest to us. Um, and the TESS planets, are, it's a little hard to see here, I didn't pick a very good color, but they're shown in green, and the important thing is they're scattered all around the sky. There's, there's only 200 confirmed planets from TESS so far, but there are over 4,000 candidates from TESS, most of which are probably likely to be planets, or a significant fraction of them. So part of the real problem we're running into now is we're finding so many potential planets that it's really becoming impossible to follow up on them individually. Um, one thing that's, that's important to note, I think, in this figure, if you look at that Kepler patch in the sky, that dark magenta patch that's all filled in, that's not a special spot in the sky. The only reason there's so many planets are there is because Kepler stared there for four years. If we were to build lots more Keplers and launch them, which I think we should do, we would be able to fill in this whole map with that density of planets. And what we know from Kepler and K2 is that there are more planets than stars in our Milky Way. So there are more than a billion planets in our Milky Way. In fact, more than 200 billion because that's how many stars there are in the Milky Way. Um, there, the other thing we know is that about half of the stars that we're surveying in our Milky Way have a planet that's small, probably rocky, and potentially habitable, meaning it's, it's at the right distance from its star where it could be the right temperature for the environment to be like here. So that, that's extrasolar planets today. Um, what, we're, what we're really leading into now is trying to understand what these planets are. So we want to characterize these planets and the, the field that I mentioned that it's really grown exponentially since I started, I really believe it's going to keep doing that because what we're seeing now is already a lot of characterization measurements of atmospheres of planets from the ground. And with JWST starting to take exoplanet measurements in this summer, we're going to see an, a huge increase in that. And a lot more people are really working and concentrating on understanding are these planets actually habitable and, and really are they inhabited? And I think those are the answers that, that people like our students here um, are gonna be answering in the next 20 years of exoplanet science. So I'm, I'm really privileged to be here. So thank you very much. It's so funny, I used to think that it was so weird that so many space people had this overt thing in their careers somewhere, 
till I discovered that the whole of American society is like that. Like 60% of CEOs have military backgrounds. When I was at like at my university, if you actually talk to the security guards, they're like significant people from the military. So this society is, I don't know. <laughs> um, but amazing accomplishments. <laughs> so this next segment is the transition to the Drake Award. And we have a special video, a sorry I couldn't be with you video from Nadia Drake, who is the daughter of Frank. And this is significant because Frank has typically been with us in this award ceremony. Um, I guess it's named after him, and there's that weird thing that he was the first recipient of an award that he was named after, which is a bit weird. <laughs> but um, his daughter, who is a science writer and a contributing writer for the National Geographic, has recorded a brief greeting to you, to the audience. So can we play that? Hello everyone, and congratulations to all of the honorees tonight. I so wish I could be there with you to celebrate your achievements and to celebrate the legacy of my Papa D, who, as we know, ignited the scientific search for extraterrestrial intelligence some six decades ago and laid the groundwork for the experiments that you all are doing today. Experiments that I think will answer the most important the most profound question that humans can ask, which is, are we alone? As someone asked me recently when I became aware of what it was my dad was doing. And as a kid, as a tiny child, I knew he was doing important stuff, stuff that he really cared about, stuff that had something to do with aliens and what else might be out there in the cosmos. And as I got older, I learned the basics of the science, but it wasn't until relatively recently that I could understand and appreciate just how important dad and his work are, how courageous he is, how daring, how inspiring, how insightful, and how necessary. And those are words that dad will never use to describe himself, which is why I am here. And I am so pleased to see the field of SETI growing and to witness the work that's being done today and to dream about the work that will be done in the future. And so again, I really wish I could be there with you tonight. Congratulations to all of the honorees and above all, thank you. The whole point of this is to talk about um, the Drake Award the whole reason that we're all here. And so I would like to welcome Bill Diamond, the CEO of the SETI Institute, to say a few words and tell us what the Drake Award is about. All right, good evening, everybody. How are we all doing? How's our hired gun doing? <laughs> So let me just say that, you know, to me, B is not completely transparent and honest because she stood up here and said, I'm just a hired gun. She's actually a member of the Science Advisory Board of the SETI Institute, and we're both honored and, and delighted and proud to count her among, among that body, which is an external group of scientists, scholars, educators, uh, who help guide us and help us understand um, where science is going, what are the new and important things and the directions, what are NASA's priorities and NSF's priorities, you know, what are the big questions that are relevant to the work we do at the Institute and how should we be navigating through this, this environment. So the Science Advisory Board is, is an amazing group, to maybe is one of our newer members, and I remember our phone call when, when I had reached out to her because other members of the board had suggested, hey, we, we want to get to maybe on, on this group. And so I had reached out to her by email, and, and she thought, this is perhaps one of the most bizarre emails I've ever received. Um, but yeah, I'm willing to take a phone call. So we had a really fun, long phone call in which um, she was saying things like, you know, why me? And I was saying, like, why not you? And uh, so here she is. <laughs> and I will say that I will never invite her back again. Um, <laughs> and the reason for that is because she 
has just raised the bar um, like to a level that I couldn't reach with a pole vault if I knew how to do that, right? So if she's frazzled, and what was the other word you used? Like, oh, blind, right? So if she's frazzled and blind and is as eloquent and articulate and, and passionate as she is, I have no, no hope whatsoever. So this is the last time you'll see to maybe up here making the rest of us look shabby uh, in her frazzled state. But um, thank you so much for being with us tonight. You've, it's been uh, amazing. And I will say that, you know, it is extraordinary. This is an example of our modern society where you have a woman, an accomplished woman, a scholar, a lawyer, an educator, um, you know, a passionate innovator who is also a single mom. You know, she's teaching, she's advising the Science Advisory Board, she's traveling because she is a hired gun for, for lots of other places. And, and, you know, and here she is tonight with her dad and with her daughter. So we're very honored and privileged to have her among us. But, you know, I think there is an element of heroism, if you'll forgive us using that word associated with you, in being able to do that, to juggle all these pieces and be with us here tonight. So thank you very much. Um, and for clarification, for to maybe's benefit and for anybody else in the audience who may not know, uh, when she said, well, you know, wh why the Carl Sagan Center for Research and what other sort of things are you doing at the Institute? Well, we do have three centers, actually. We have the Carl Sagan Center for Research, which is where all our, our scientists reside and uh, who are divided into the six, six branches of science that are part of the multidisciplinary nature of the work we do, which pretty much covers the entire spectrum of the natural sciences. Uh, but we also have the Center for Outreach and we have the Center for Education. And the Outreach Center is really all about doing things like this, like engaging with the public, storytelling, and uh, sharing the work we do and the work that our scientists do with the public at large. And that's as important a part of our mission, I think, as the research itself. And the education program that we run and that we, uh, that we uh, do on behalf of, of NASA, on behalf of the National Science Foundation, in partnership with private individuals and philanthropists who support our work, that's all about leveraging the general fascination that I think so many people have with space and science and exploration and astronauts and what is out there. Leveraging that to say, look, this is kind of cool. It's interesting. It's fascinating. There are big questions. If you're paying attention now, now we've got you. Now we can talk about science. Now we can teach you science with context, something you can wrap your hands around, something you can get excited about, and it's fun and it's not fearful. Right? So this is what our education programs are all about. So that is the, you know, the three f sort of foundational pillars of the work we do at the Institute. So hopefully that, that clarifies that for Tamebi and, and for all the rest of you. I do want to thank Lou for uh, standing up and, and talking about the amazing work that our undergraduates have done. And I think Lou and, our, and, and the students themselves would be the first to say that you know, it is wonderful to get recognized, but it is all about collaboration. Um, you know, whether it's collaborating with mentors or collaborating with colleagues or collaborating with, uh, with people at, at other organizations or institutions, nothing they have done, nothing we do is done in isolation. Doug led a team of about 18 people on the Kepler mission. And so, you know, it, it, it takes a village, uh, as, as to maybe said. So we're very much on board with that, with that same philosophy. Um, I also want to thank Lou for raising uh, the controversy of whether Pluto is a planet or not. <laughs> How many Pluto is a planet? Okay, all right. How many Pluto is not a planet? Okay, you know, it's kind of 50-50. This is where that kind of controversy belongs, at the SETI Institute. So thank you for bringing that up. Okay, so I don't want to keep you until tomorrow's breakfast, so I do want to move ahead to the real major part of tonight's program. Uh, and I hope the audio isn't screwed up by the fact that I've got a mic here and a mic here, but I have some prepared remarks that I, I do want to share with you. So, um, so with the SETI Institute's Drake Award event, we do celebrate those who have made outstanding contributions to SETI research and to the field of astrobiology more broadly, or the study of life in the universe. We do this in honor of Frank Drake, as you've heard now many times, who arguably pioneered the field of exploring the cosmos for science of technology as a proxy for life and intelligence. Using the 85-foot diameter radio telescope 
operated by the then newly created National Radio Astronomy Observatory, NRAO, in 1960. At the Green Bank Observatory, Frank undertook the first ever SETI search of two nearby star systems looking for narrowband radio frequency transmissions that might belie the presence of technologically advanced alien civilizations. He called the project OSMA, and he set the stage for what has become perhaps one of humanity's most profound research endeavors to answer the question, are we alone in the universe? One year later, at a small gathering of scientists in Green Bank, chaired by Frank and including astronomer Carl Sagan, uh, neuroscientist John Lilly, and nine others, Frank formulated the so-called Drake Equation, which has become the roadmap for astrobiology and is arguably the second most famous equation in all of science. So Frank, as you know, could not be here with us tonight, but he did prepare a message which he asked me to read on his behalf, which I have here. So Frank writes, greetings, everyone. The Drake Award ceremony is one of my favorite SETI events because it celebrates the accomplishments of hardworking scientists who are fueling future advances for SETI's missions. This year's honoree, Shelley Wright, richly deserves this award. I have worked with her and observed her firsthand when Optical SETI was launched. I'm very happy that she is nominated and selected to be this year's recipient. My congratulations also to Doug Caldwell and the summer intern awardees this evening. You all have played major roles in the success of SETI and of the SETI Institute. Many thanks to the Board of Trustees, the Science Advisory Board, Bill Diamond, Natalie Cabral, Jill Targer, Seth Shostak, the staff and employees of the SETI Institute. I'm sorry not to be able to be with you this evening. My family and I want to convey our deep appreciation to each and every one of you, and we wish all of you continued success. Frank Drake, May 12, 2022. So the Drake Award is presented at the discretion of the SETI Institute's Board of Trustees. It's based on nominations by its Science Advisory Board. Past recipients have included Frank Drake himself, as we talked about, Nobel Laureate and inventor of the laser, Charles Towns, principal investigator for NASA's Kepler mission, Bill Baruki, pioneering astrobiologist, Vicki Meadows, radio astronomer and SETI researcher, Jason Wright, and last year, Harvard's Paul Horowitz and Berkeley's Dan Wertheimer, who have made decades of contributions to the field of SETI. This year, we honor observational and experimental astrophysicist and associate professor of physics at UC San Diego, Dr. Shelley Wright. Shelley is fascinated by and passionate about using science and technology to search for evidence of life beyond Earth by looking for the signatures of advanced civilization in the form of laser pulses that can be detected across interstellar space and are easily differentiated from natural phenomena. Together, actually, with Paul Horwitz, Dan Wertheimer, and Frank Drake himself, Shelley is pioneering the field of optical SETI. So at this time, I'd like to ask Shelley to come forward, join me on stage. Uh, well, actually, first, I think before we do that, instead of having her see this from here, which is impossible, stay where you are, Shelley. We have a little introductory video that tells you a little story about Shelley and her work, if we can roll that. In 1998, Shelley Wright, an undergraduate at the University of California, Santa Cruz, was using a telescope at the Lick Observatory to search for signs of intelligence elsewhere in the Milky Way galaxy. She hoped to find brief flashes from alien lasers. Her experiment is an example of optical SETI, or an optical search for extraterrestrial intelligence. The telescope is aimed at a nearby star system, and the collected light is directed through a device constructed by Wright to detect any fast laser flashes. The instrument is the white box at the eyepiece end of the scope. If any extraterrestrials are using pulsed lasers to signal in our direction, this device, consisting of three fast light detectors, might find it. Using a trio of detectors eliminates nearly all of the false alarms caused by instrumental effects or cosmic rays hitting the equipment. As a grad student, Wright was advised by mentors not to do SETI. No, 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 they said, but she was hooked on the idea of finding extraterrestrials. I'm a professor at University of California, San Diego. My bread and butter is constructing instruments for large ground-based telescopes, like the massive 10 meter Keck telescopes in Hawaii, and the even more massive telescope like the future 30 meter telescope. But over my entire career, I've always continued to build SETI instruments. Our hope is to achieve every SETI scientist's dream to observe the entire night sky all of the time. 
A large radio telescope can cost hundreds of millions of dollars. Unique optical study devices that monitor the entire night sky for optical or even infrared flashes can be built for thousands of times less. Today, our team is designing and constructing a dedicated optical observatory to search the entire sky all of the time for unique ET communication. Despite her research in other areas of astronomy, she always came back to SETI, optical SETI. Wright's instruments work both at visible wavelengths, the light our eyes can see, and also in the infrared. If you're trying to signal someone hundreds of light years away, visible light could be blocked by clouds of dust hanging between the stars. But infrared penetrates the dust, making it usable for long distance communication. Why would aliens aim powerful lasers at the sky? Perhaps for communication with their own space probes or colonies. With lasers, the flow of information can be much faster than using radio. It's like going from a dial-up modem to 5G internet. Advanced extraterrestrials will know of this advantage of optical communications. It's conceivable that older galactic societies are interconnected by a network of laser communication links, much like optical fibers here on Earth. We still haven't found compelling evidence of extraterrestrials in the cosmos, but the work of Shelley Wright may change that situation. Perhaps next year, perhaps tomorrow. <laughs>All right, so at this time, I'd like to ask Shelley to come on up and join me, and also the chairman of the board of the SETI Institute, Dan Langford. <laughs> come on over here, we can do this right. at center stage. Hi, everybody. This is Shelley. That's Shelley. And this is the award. Let me show it to everybody. Solid gold. It has, by the way, the, the Voyager um, plaque on the back, the golden record. So it's really kind of cool. <laughs> and more importantly, I'm supposed to open this and hand this to you. Where do I put that? In your wallet, oh, I think. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Oh, is my mic on? Is that? You can hear me? Well, thank you so much to the SETI Institute and the board for this amazing recognition. And thank you all for coming tonight virtually and also in person. It's so great to see all of you. And um, as Steve maybe said, I, I probably mispronounced your name, but um, teamwork really is dream work. That is a great quote. Thank you for that. Um, science is a team effort, and especially experimental science where we build instruments and it's interdisciplinary and we work with engineers and computer scientists, administrative staff. It is a huge team. And I'd like to thank a few folks that have really brought me here today in the SETI world um, to do all of this. And first and foremost, I'd like to thank Frank Drake. Um, he was my mentor. I had the great fortune to work with him when I was an undergrad at UC Santa Cruz and just meeting him. And he spent time with me and mentored me through those years. And that was literally transformative, as I'm standing here to show in that, in that cosmic meeting. I'd also like to thank Remington Stone and Lori Hatch. Uh, they were really instrumental in my early career. They're sitting over here. Um, <laughs> Many of the images you even saw here tonight were taken by Lori Hatch, she's a, a terrific photographer. And it was Rem Stone's early vision in the 1990s that brought SETI to the Lick Observatory, especially at that time when SETI was a little still taboo. Rem did that. I'd also like to thank Dan Wertheimer, a fellow recipient of the Drake Award, who's here tonight. Dan has been a mentor, a friend, a collaborator for, through all these decades, um, and he's just a fantastic scientist, and it's great working with you, Dan. And I know others are not here tonight, like Paul Horwitz, who is literally the creme de la creme of scientists. <laughs> he's amazing, awe-inspiring. 
And even um, his pupil and his graduate student who's here, Andrew Howard, is here tonight. Andrew is now a professor at Caltech and understands the demographics of those exoplanets that Doug Caldwell was talking about. And both Paul and Andrew have pushed the field of SETI, so thank you for that. I also would like to thank Jerome Mayer, who I hope is watching virtually. Jerome has been working in my lab for the last decade. He's an incredibly creative scientist and has helped all of this. And that's just a few people. Honestly, there's dozens of undergraduate students that have come through our lab. We have graduate students, we have engineers. Thank you all to the UC San Diego Optical Infrared Lab for all of your contributions, and also at the Berkeley Research Study Center. They've been instrumental working on the projects that I'll talk to you about tonight. And to do this work, we need resources. And in SETI, public daughter dollars can be scarce. So it's thanks to the generous support of lifting up these programs. In particular, I want to thank Bill and Susan Bloomfield and their family foundation for much of the instrumentation we'll show tonight, as well as Franklin Antonio for his contributions. On a personal note, I'd like to thank uh, my father, Chad, and uh, his wife, Janice, who's here tonight. They've been supportive throughout um, my career and my life, of course. My mother, my loving mother, who's uh, probably watching virtually. Hi, Mom. <laughs> I feel like everybody has to say that. Um, and then my extraordinary wife, uh, Quinn Konopaki. She's a fellow astronomer, and uh, she's really maybe a better person and scientist. So thank you for that. OK, well, I would like to tell you a little bit more about where we're going with all of this. Um, in particular in the field of optical SETI. And we've heard a little bit tonight, that was a, a lovely video talking about what is optical SETI. Um, but I want to start with a little bit of cosmic perspective. So this is my favorite image ever taken by humanity. Okay, this was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. If you extend your arm all the way out and you hold a pencil at the tip of that pencil is almost the area of the sky that this picture covers. And every little smudge you see in this picture is another galaxy. Yeah, I'm, I'm dead serious. This is my favorite picture. <laughs> Every little smudge, the teeny, 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 teeny guys here, that's another galaxy. And that can allow us to calculate the number of galaxies in the entire universe. So it's about 100 billion observable galaxies in the universe. Now, galaxies, of course, are made up of hundreds of billions of stars. This is an analog of a Milky Way type galaxy that's nearby to us, face on. Beautiful spiral-like galaxy, spiral arms, a dense bulge at the center. And if you heard the news, Event Horizon Telescope just released today that they imaged the supermassive black hole at the center of our Milky Way. An amazing, amazing discovery. So you have 100 billion galaxies and you have 100 billion stars per galaxy. You multiply that, you get a whole bunch of freaking stars. It's 10 to the 22 stars, OK? And what we just learned from Doug Caldwell is that stars have planets, lots and lots of planets. We just learned that in the last 15 years. It's amazing. You know, when I remember being in school and they were saying, they kept telling me, oh, don't go into SETI. It could be a rare Earth. Like, there's nobody out there. That's not true. There's planets everywhere. And smaller planets, like our terrestrial planets, like Earth, are even more common. So it begs anybody to ask what could be living on that surface. Right? This is astrobiology. What is, what is going on on these other worlds? And does it have intelligent life? We have lots of intelligent life here on Earth. Does it have intelligent life with technology? Okay. And if they had technology, would they be communicating? And that's really the philosophical principle of SETI, right? We're looking for technology. And we are one technological civilization existing now in the universe. Now, I'm an astronomer. And for a SETI, we use the basics of science. So what we look for is communication using light, right? Light is the fastest way to get information to and from the stars. And light is vast, right? It has different energies and frequencies. We can go from radio wavelengths out to optical wavelengths to infrared wavelengths, just like the movie said. And this is what Frank Drake did, right? So Frank Drake, in 1960, used the Green Bank Telescope. He was a visionary scientist. 
and use the tools of science to ask the question of whether there was radio communication. Okay? That stemmed radio study, and for the last, well, 60 years, we've been doing study at radio frequencies. For instance, the Allen Telescope Array that's being led by the SETI Institute is a new facility coming online in Northern California that is coming online to do major searches in SETI. Now, my area and my expertise is at optical, visible light, like our eye sees. Now, the premise of optical SETI came from another Drake Award uh, awardee, Charles Towns. Charles Towns, in 1959, invented a laser. Charles Towns was so thoughtful. He knew when he invented it that this was going to be revolutionary to science, all of science. And we see it everywhere we go, in the medical industry, everywhere. And two years after he invented the laser at Bell Laboratories, he wrote a paper, a nature paper with Schwartz that said, wow, basically, this would be a great way to communicate over interstellar distances. Lasers are bright. Look how bright this is. That's, that's so bright, guys. This is a milliwatt, right? This is a teeny, teeny laser. And if you are in the other receiving of a laser, you know it is bright. You're not supposed to shine it in your eyes. Okay? It means that if you send a laser signal over vast, large distances, you could collect that light with a very small telescope. Even if it traverses thousands of light years, you can make a small aperture and collect it and detect whether there is a laser signal. And that, in 1961, was the premise of optical SETI. But it took many decades for it to come into place. And it was thanks to Dan Wertheimer and Paul Horwitz's work in the late 90s when they started to build detectors to look for laser signals. And this is where my story folds in. Okay, we first started trying to look at laser signals for potential laser pulses or any transient optical signal. Now, here is the trick here. So Charlestown knew, this is, we have this image, we've been showing this all night. This is the Milky Way. I like to think we're living in the Milky Way like we're living in a Frisbee disk, right? We're looking through that Frisbee disk and in that Frisbee disk, there's 200 billion stars and in between the stars, there's interstellar gas and dust that when optical light traverses through it, it gets absorbed and you see those black patches, right? If you go to longer wavelengths of light, the Milky Way becomes more transparent. So if I move to infrared here, you can see the stars. So the selection of the frequency of light for which we measure is important, especially for the distances if we want to observe different stellar systems at further distances, just to see that dramatic effect visible infrared, visible in infrared. Now, I went on and did other instrumentation, but I specialized in infrared detectors. And what I monitored over years with our team was whether there would be infrared detectors that could do this, that could do near infrared study or infrared study, okay? but the same premise of looking for lasers. And that's what we did. We set out and we built something called Nero SETI, or the Near Infrared SETI experiment. This is a picture of Jerome Mayer um, back at University of Toronto, where we were working with a lot of companies in research and development to test just the right detector that could do the job for optical SETI, quote, optical SETI, but at near infrared wavelengths. We took this instrument and we commissioned it here in 2015 at Lick Observatory on the One Meter Telescope. So it's sitting at the base of it, the telescope collects the light and brings the light back to the box at the bottom. Now what's special about this instrument, as opposed to other astronomical instruments, is that it's capable of taking a picture every nanosecond. So every one one billionth of a second, it takes a picture and sees whether there's a signal there. Now it splits the light, there's complications. I love to geek out about this stuff. I can talk to you in the hallways about it, but it tries to look for it, okay? Now I wanna demonstrate something about the challenges and how vast our search is here. So this was great, you know, it's not that great. I'll be, I'll be honest with you guys here. So what we have to do in SETI is we have to look at many, many stars, billions of stars, right? 
And if you think about a telescope, you have to put a telescope and look at one star over here and another star over there and another star over here. And what we use this term as is called duty cycle. You can only observe each system or each patch of the sky for a certain length of time. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. Time, that's a, there's a lot of time in the universe, right? So you can see the challenge. This is true for any SETI experiment. This isn't just, it's a SETI problem. You want to look at vast areas of our sky, but you want to look at them all the, the time, right? Not just for 10 minutes or two hours. So about five years ago, we decided to start thinking about this problem. And we got a team, a small team of scientists, and went to NASA Ames, and we started brainstorming about ways we could make an all-sky, all-time observatory. We needed to make a dedicated study facility where we could always look at the night sky and look at the transient night sky for this experiment. And it was through these collaborations and these discussions that germinated the ideas I'm about to show you. So what we worked on was trying to develop a way to make a telescope that could do wide field imaging. Okay? And this is what our project we're currently working on, which is called panoramic study or pano SETI. And on the right there shows about a half meter sized telescope. So in the front of it, a 20 inches is a Fresnel lens. Okay? And a telescope right takes it and images the light down to a focal plane where we place a detector. And this is a nice detector here that we smit at the back end and it slides up. And it comes to focus and you can kind of see these pixels here. Okay? And these, okay, these are called multi-photon pixel counting devices. They're MPPCs, they're super cool. And they can image at gigahertz speed, so they can take nanosecond images. And through our collaborations, we built a readout chip that's capable of reading out nanoseconds, microseconds, milliseconds, two seconds. So any of that time domain up to that billionth of time between a nanosecond to a second. Now this image is about every 10 by 10 degrees. You remember at the beginning I showed you the Hubble image where you held up your hand and the pencil? Okay, well now if you just, everybody, hey, this is interactive, put your arm up, okay, extend your fist out, you're now becoming an astronomer, okay? <laughs> that fist length on the sky is about 10 degrees, okay? And so try the image, you gotta do 10 degrees, that's a 10 degree patch. Okay, so we took some of these and we had some good luck. In February of 2020, Remember that day, February of 2020, our team went up to Lick Observatory, and the Lick Observatory refurbished this dome called the Astrograph, and we put in two of our prototype telescopes. Of course, March 2020 <laughs> came down, and what was fortuitous about this is that um, we do a, what we astronomers now called, thanks to 2020, pajama mode, where we could work from home and take data on the sky. And that's what we did for this last year, was take data and learn about our instrument and our software, because we made a complicated machine looking at the sky. And here's some data, I'm gonna show you some data. So there's two telescopes there, the west module, east module, they're looking at the same patch of that sky. Remember that 10 by 10 square degree field of view? Here it is, that's 10 by 10 square degree field of view. And you see it, just a few fields of stars, right? We're not out here to make pretty pictures. We're out here to take, look for transient events. And just to give you a scale of 10 by 10 square degrees, the moon is this on the plane of the sky. Okay, So that's a half a degree is the moon. So one of our telescopes can look now at a 10 by 10 square degree patch and take a nanosecond image. Now, if we want to image the entire sky, we have to make many of these. Okay, I'm going to show you some data. This is a Calypso. This is a NASA, site, a NASA satellite called Calypso. NASA's actually made a satellite that's shooting lasers down at Earth. And they're doing it because they're studying high level aerosols in the upper Earth's atmosphere. But our team was like, whoa, this is cool. We're looking for pulse lasers and NASA's pulsing lasers. So what we did is we took our telescope, we looked and calculated right when Calypso would fly over Lick Observatory. We had it all set up because you only get like a minute before the thing streaks by. And lo and behold, boom, boom, bust, pulse, 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 you see it go through. And you would think, well, yeah, that's what you designed it to do, but I can tell you every time I built an instrument, you're like this, does it gonna work? Is it gonna work? It worked. Um, and I, I love this, we were so excited for it. Thank you. 
So what are we doing now? We want to make a bunch of these. So this is our current concept right now. This is a, a rendering that shows a rolling roof dome that would pull apart. And inside the dome, you see about 24 telescopes. And there's about four telescopes per mount. So again, each telescope is about half meter on the sky. Now, is it all sky? Well, no, but it's covering lots of area. So this is what it would look like if you configured the, the mounts and looked at the plane of the sky. You have those six configurations of four, 24 telescopes. 24 times 10 by 10 is 24,000. It's uh, 2,400. Whoops, I can't do math on the, the podium. 2,400 square degrees. So every nanosecond, we can take an instantaneous picture of 2,400 square degrees. And this is trying to get us to this all sky. You can reconfigure it. You can look at different things. We're interested in looking at astrophysical transients and following up, like gravitational wave events. Okay. And to do this, I haven't talked about one big premise for SETI and optical SETI. You kind of always need two. You always need two telescopes to be looking at the same patch of the sky to have unambiguous detection. It's critical. It's critical because of noise, but it's also critical because if you're going to make a really important discovery, you got to be sure. So to do this, we want to build two observatories, and we're looking at doing this at Lick Observatory, our old friend Lick Observatory, and coming back to it. So if we zoom in, and we're going to come down to California and come down to close to where we are, because Lick Observatory is right up here, we go into daytime, and we land at Lick. And here's the Lick Observatory. Panosite 1 has been selected. Panosite 2 is there. And if we come through, this is our location. If you've been to Lick, for people in the audience, that would be the location of one of our observatories. There's the old main building. This is where Nero SETI is. That was the Nickel Telescope. And if we move over to a secondary site here, you can see the top view of our 24 telescopes. Both of these get linked by about a one kilometer fiber, a single mode fiber that allows precision timing at a nanosecond precision. So when we observe from one telescope to the next telescope, we know the exact nanosecond for when they occurred. We're using a process called White Rabbit that was invented by the Large Hydron Collider. And you get to observe the full sky at 2,400 square degrees. And this is what we're trying to do in the coming months. This project, Panoramic Pacific, is from UC San Diego, the UC Berkeley, UC Observatories, our collaborators at Harvard and Caltech. And again, I just want to thank the SETI Institute and thank all of you for coming out tonight. Your support means so much to me. Thank you. say about that. <laughs> I go to a lot of space events. Like, I speak at a lot of them. I travel all around the world. And it's like, there's um, a lot of the new projects that you hear about. It's kind of like they're marketing for a terrestrial application. So the company, like, they're maybe making, like, air quality monitors for something, and then they're investing their money in a space project. So, and they don't need a lot of money to make a lot of money from those space projects because it's kind of like marketing. So the whole time I'm listening to that, I'm kind of waiting for, like, you know, what is the, what is the thing? And then I'm, like, saying, oh, I remember the conversation that I had with Bill where Bill was, like, yeah, but those people are not doing space. They're kind of hanging around Earth, which is pretty clustered. You hear about the space debris issue. Like, what we're doing is like real science. So it's actually in space. So I'm like, as I'm listening to that, I'm like, okay, so there doesn't need to be a terrestrial application. But then towards the end, I don't, I'm not a scientist, but I was like, actually, I'm trying to figure out that I think that there could be some application. I don't know, but
but it was pretty interesting. So that's it. Um, and then the other thing that I got from that, which was really interesting, and I was so happy to hear about all the people that you mentioned that worked with you on that project, and it then took me back to Nadia's video, you know, talking about her dad, and the whole idea of community that we're talking about, and just started making me think of my ex-husband, and just like how if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't even be where I am today because it takes so many people, like these heroes that you see, it takes all these people supporting them to be there, to be long suffering. I think that's why I'm divorced. Like, <laughs> I was too busy traveling to like look after my household. But like, you know, it's like, it's, it, takes, it takes all these long suffering people and, and, and things to make these things happen. So as we transition into hearing from Drake, himself. I think even though in my opening remarks I was critiquing the hero model and saying that that's old school. There are heroes for a reason. I'm wearing Jordans <laughs> and it's like my dad was like, are you into basketball now? I'm like, no, I just heard that it was cool. And even though like before when I heard it was cool, I was like, I thought that was just for young people. And then someone told me black people, we never age. We always look cool. So I'm like, I'm wearing Jordans tonight. <laughs> um, I can't remember where, I don't know how that came into the conversation, sorry. But I think this is a great way to just call up everyone that, has, that we've highlighted tonight to come up on stage as we hear from the person who all this started from to, to show this fusion of the idea of heroicism and community being something that can go hand in hand. So you can be someone that creates a legacy, that, that establishes something that a whole bunch of people follow without being this superstar at the top that is just like, I don't care about anyone around me. So if I can invite all those people to come up on stage who were awarded tonight or... Searching for evidence of intelligent extraterrestrials, aliens. This endeavor. <laughs> this array of antennas, situated in the Cascade Mountains of Northern California, is not tracing the interstellar gas of our galaxy. It's not imaging objects like pulsars, quasars, or the neighborhoods of black holes. It's searching for evidence of intelligent extraterrestrials, aliens. This endeavor is known as SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. It is a daring experiment that could forever alter humanity's view of itself. An experiment to use modern technology to find other galactic inhabitants was first attempted by a soft-spoken astronomer named Frank Drake. Born in Chicago at the start of the Great Depression, Drake was interested in chemistry and electronics. He enrolled at Cornell University and was part of a Navy officer training program. After graduating, Drake was put in charge of electronics aboard a Navy cruiser, the USS Albany. In 1955, he entered Harvard as a radio astronomy grad student. After receiving his degree, the young Frank Drake joined the newly minted National Radio Astronomy Observatory in the soft hills of West Virginia. The observatory had just purchased an off-the-shelf radio antenna sporting an 85-foot dish, and Drake, the new guy in town, was encouraged to think of experiments befitting this instrument. What followed was a two-month observing program he christened Project Ozma after the fictional Princess Oz in Frank Baum's book. In an experiment that discomfited some astronomers, Drake used the antenna to look for radio signals coming from the directions of two nearby stars, places that could conceivably house planets with intelligent beings. He wasn't studying natural processes, but looking for emissions launched into space by an extraterrestrial society. He didn't find any alien signals, but Project Ozma had generated a tidal wave of interest. 
A year later, Drake was encouraged by the National Academy of Sciences to convene a small meeting of a dozen scientists to weigh the odds that we could find aliens by eavesdropping on radio transmissions. The meeting was held in the fall of 1961 at the observatory where Drake had done Project Ozma. As agenda for the meeting, he wrote a simple equation on a blackboard that would estimate the number of on-the-air societies that exist in our galaxy. This agenda, now known as the Drake Equation, has been called the second most famous equation in science. Thus began the modern era of SETI. Drake had planted a seed that has sprouted into several signal searches in progress today. These efforts are constrained not by a lack of technical expertise or astronomical knowledge, but by a shortage of funding. SETI is run on monies donated by a handful of interested individuals. We will need to search through literally at least millions of stars to give us a good chance of finding a signal from another civilization. SETI experiments have not yet found proof of extraterrestrials, but a small number of scientists are continuing the search with new observation programs and the development of new receiving equipment. By 2035, these experiments will have reconnoitered about one million planetary systems, an impressive sample. So it's conceivable that Drake's audacious experiment will soon pay off, that we will learn that humans are not the only intelligent species in the cosmos, that we share the universe with others. So before we all retreat for more refreshments, I'd like to ask Dan Wertheimer to join us up on stage, who is Drake Award recipient last year. Uh, Paul Horwitz is in here. And also Jason Wright. Jason out there. Jason, come on up. Well, where did Natalie run off to? Did she? Where is Natalie? There she is. Come on up here as well. And for those of you in the audience, um, you know, there are a number of scientists from the SETI Institute here tonight. We have also Dr. Andrew Simeon, who uh, is the Bernard M. Oliver Chair of SETI Research at the Institute and also heads the Breakthrough Listen Initiative at the Berkeley SETI Program. And he's here with our entire team from the Hat Creek Radio Observatory up in Northern California. And so they're all here tonight. Please find them and talk to them and let them tell you about it. So you can talk to Shelley. Some of her colleagues and, and friends are here and uh, they can talk about optical SETI. Our team uh, from Hat Creek can talk to you about radio SETI. Natalie and her colleagues can talk to you about astrobiology. Doug and his colleagues, we've got some other folks from the Kepler team are in the audience tonight, can talk to you about exoplanets, perhaps short of finding uh, the sign of ET or even signs of biology on nearby worlds. I think the, the Kepler mission and the discovery that planets are ubiquitous in the universe is perhaps one of the most profound discoveries in all of modern human history. So it's pretty exciting, and it's pretty exciting to have Doug up here with me uh, in that regard. So anyway, lots of interesting conversations yet to be had. Thank you all very much for coming uh, and joining us tonight and to celebrating these individuals, their teams, their colleagues, the Institute, and the work we do. We really appreciate your time, energy, and passion in being with us tonight. And I'd like to thank to maybe, and I have a little token of our appreciation here hiding behind you, Aww. but <laughs> a little something else to try and stuff on the airplane <laughs> as you head to your next destination. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I, I do want to say that even though I had the scripts, they had the confidence to be like, you can say whatever you want. And I think that's pretty cool because not many institutions have that confidence. And so that shows, you know, that shows something that you have, you believe that you have value and it's up for scrutiny. So congratulations to you all. Thank you, Dan and Rima and JG. I don't know which of our other trustees are also here tonight, but we have members of the board here. So please also introduce yourselves to them. We really are grateful and appreciative of their support. And uh, thank you again all very much. Please go out and let the, uh, let the party continue. Well, 
Frank, uh, the party is continuing, but we are here to thank everybody who joined us this evening virtually. We hope you enjoyed the, the presentation, uh, the, the science, which is absolutely amazing. Um, uh, if you want to find out more about uh, Shelley's work, of course, we, we have some material on our website. If you want to find out more about the SETI Institute's uh, work, uh, we also have um, an optical SETI program called Laser SETI, and uh, uh, you can find out lots more information about that uh, program as well. Um, we'd like to thank also who's behind the scenes, uh, Lee, Jasmine, uh, Rebecca, uh, the team who bring you these SETI talks and bring you the, the Drake Awards, um, a wonderful uh, uh, team behind the, behind the camera. Um, thank you, a reminder that the SETI Institute is a nonprofit organization. And, and uh, if you want to find out more about what we do and would like to join our mission, please again, go to our website and find out more. Um, on behalf of everybody at the SETI Institute and Frank, um, we would wish you a very pleasant evening and we look forward to seeing you at an event soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.